An in, bonjour. Joel Egerwissen, Cass. Welcome to part four of the um, history of Turtle Island. You wish. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Um, I want to say miigwech again for joining me. We're going to wrap it up here in this next episode. Um, so far, we've walked through <laughs> about 400 years of, uh, of history through an indigenous lens. And again, this lesson is so important for me and so many First Nations people because um, we grew up learning the worst things about our people. And after this much genocide and assimilation, <clears throat> again, speaking for myself, it was hard to argue all those stereotypes because I did come from a long line of um, substance abuse and um, just, just no culture in my family. So this is a very important story for Canadians to hear, not just First Nations people. While the residential school system was being created, um, I know who created it, but I'm not gonna, gonna name names. There's a, a certain gentleman I encourage you to do the research and see the grandfather or the forefather or the architect of the residential school system and the Canadian education system as well. Because while we were being taught to hate ourselves in these schools in order to um, enfranchise us, um, the rest of Canada, the mainstream Canadians, the European children, they were also being taught to hate us as well. Um, it's no secret that I grew up, or it's no surprise that I grew up with those stereotypes. Those stereotypes were taught in our schools. Um, when I was in grade nine, I had a French textbook that described First Nations people as les très sauvages, right? I was in grade nine, and they're calling me a savage in a textbook in my high school. This went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, it's no surprise that the majority of Canada thinks these awful things about us. It's not because just your parents told them, it's because your parents' textbooks and their textbooks and your textbooks all taught the same thing to everybody across North America, that First Nations people were the awful things that we think they are today. Only in the last two years has residential schools been actually mentioned in a curriculum textbook in the school board that I work for, in the province that I work for. Um, and it's my job to come into the schools and talk to students uh, about the details and tell the story because um, it's really hard for teachers to tackle this subject because, again, for generations, they, they didn't know this stuff. Um, a lot of times when I come into classes and I do this presentation, people think I'm exaggerating or, you know, I'm, I'm not pulling, not, not speaking facts. I mean, believe me, I've been studying this for 25 years, and you can do the research yourself. You want to look back and find those books. This is the story of Turtle Island through the Indigenous perspective. So... Um, I got my work cut out for me. I work for a Catholic school board, and a lot of people criticize me for that. How can you work for that school board? And the fact is, there's a lot of First Nations students in the school board. There's a lot of little brown faces walking the halls in these schools. I mean, like these were run by the church for generations. We were taught, yeah, you go to these Catholic places, you go to church, you know, three, four times a week. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that our Catholic schools are filled with First Nations people. Um, I've worked for both school boards. I work for a public board and I, I work for the Catholic now. <clears throat> to be honest, I, I almost prefer the Catholic board because there's so much to teach <laughs> and so much to learn. Um, but also the freedom of spirituality is, is a little more flexible, I find, in working for the two boards. I can talk about spirit. I can talk about the Creator. I can use my bundle a, li a little more openly in the schools. I find personally with my experience working in both boards. <clears throat> so, residential schools, full blown. Again, last one in 1996, 97, closes in, in northern um, Turtle Island. <sighs> what happened was they didn't just close because um, they didn't work or because they wanted to close them. What happened was media began to become a thing. You know, newspaper, the radio, television began to become a thing, right, in the 1940s and 30s. Uh, 50s even. So people began to find out about these places. Um, the average human being, when they find out you are taking five-year-old children away from their families and putting them into these schools and basically torturing and brainwashing them for 10 years, and that doesn't fly with most humans. 
um, government policy with a specific directive of you know, economic gain, that's one thing. But once the word started to get out, it looked really bad. So the government began to close down these schools slowly, slowly, one at a time across, across Canada as the media began to become more aware. Um, but things kind of shifted from that too. Um, I, I think I really want to move on from these schools because it, it breaks my heart to talk about it, um, especially as it affected me in my life. Um, the echo, the, the effect, the intergenerational trauma is the, is the word that we use to kind of describe this because that's what we're suffering today is the intergenerational effects of these schools. Um, I didn't go to residential school, but my grandfather did. And um, my grandfather didn't hug me once growing up. Think about your, your grandparents. Think about your children. You know, I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, I don't know if your grandparents hugged you or you know, talked to you or loved you, but in these schools, they didn't learn how to be good parents. They learned how to be pedophiles. They learned how to be abusive. They learned how to hate themselves. And that's what came out of the schools back into our communities. That was my grandfather. Right? Not to say that he was a pedophile, but I'm saying he didn't learn to be a good father, a good husband, a good brother, a good grandfather, you know, a good son. He learned to hate himself in these schools. These kids came out traumatized, PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. They had it their whole lives once they left the school at 15 years old. And just, and I can't imagine, like I say, my daughter is the light of my life. You've seen her in my... You've seen her in my videos, right? She's my sunshine. She runs up to me every time I see her, jumps into my arms. I love you so much, That's what she says. Now imagine you pour five years of your heart and soul and life into this beautiful little child, and you know one day there's gonna be a knock at your door, and a priest or a police officer or an Indian agent's gonna be there, and they're gonna take your little girl away from you, and you know where she's going. She's not going to learn English. She's going to the most unimaginable, torturous place that we've ever had here in North America. And she's gonna have to live there for 10 years and every day, she's just thinking, where's... Where's my dad? How come he's not coming to help me? To get me out of here? Thousands of children ran away from these places over those hundreds of years. Charlie Cheney Winjack is a popular story that Gord Downey helped bring to light about a boy who ran away and froze to death in the snow. There's thousands of those stories. And if you lived in Quebec, they would take your child to Saskatchewan. If you lived in BC, they'd take your child to Ontario to make sure that the parents couldn't come and rescue their children. Many times they wouldn't even tell them exactly what school they were going to. They would say, you know, they'd just expect them back when they were 15 years old. And then again, they didn't document the deaths properly. So your kid might have died when he was nine years old and you didn't find out until he didn't get off the, the bus or the wagon when he was supposed to 10 years later. One thing I hear a lot about in Canada is to is get, get over it. You know, that was a long time ago. Why are we still talking about this? It wasn't a long time ago. And even if it was, you have to understand the ripple effect that is the intergenerational trauma for our people. And again, we still don't talk about it as Canadians. If we want to reconcile our relationship between nations, every Canadian needs to hear this truth. I get it. It's a sad truth. It's a dark history. It's our dirty little secret. But if we want to move forward, Every Canadian needs to know this truth. I debate what age to teach them. This history, I've chosen grade eight to go into the classrooms and do this half day um, lesson. 
because I feel like grade eight, you need to know before you start to go into high school and get all these prejudices to your, not your, to your cup fills up too much with those <sighs> lies, those stereotypes about indigenous people. So once the residential schools kind of started to die down and Canadians started to catch wind of it, um, then the 60s scoop began where they would take babies as soon as they were born from First Nations families and adopt them into non-First Nations families. Again, the whole purpose is this, right? If we can't do this anymore, what can we do? We still got to do it. We still have this financial burden that we've promised to share the resources of this land. So they began to take our children away from us and put us into white homes. Again, ship them across the country, maybe to different nations, adopt them out so that they would never learn the true history of who they were and they'd sign over their status so they would no longer be a, a burden on Her Majesty's government. Um, that financial burden that they talk about in all those papers throughout, throughout Canadian history. So the 60s stoop went on for a very long time, and to be honest, it's, even though it's slowed down with today's internet and media and word getting out to people, um, I, t I, I, I really think that we turn a blind eye as a North American mainstream society I think most of us don't want to know this, right? They want to believe it's ancient history and not a part of their world. But believe me, the intergenerational trauma that has occurred from this history we just talked about is real and alive, powerful and strong to this very day, right here in front of you, right? Um, it's a long, sad story, man, that again, you're not gonna find in a lot of textbooks but it's a part of our identity. It's part of our truth as people who live here in, on Turtle Island. And it's a truth that every Canadian needs to know so that you're not looking at me that way. You know, you're not looking at that guy downtown holding the bottle, asking for change. He didn't choose to be there. He's there because of a long line of government policies that put him there. And he doesn't even know why. That's another thing. People come to me and they say, oh, well, don't First Nations people know this? You know, you're a First Nations kid in the classroom, your teacher looks at you, hey, Linda, uh, you're First Nations, right? Why don't you tell us about residential schools? <laughs> Man, you think Linda knows this? You think I knew about this? This isn't just Canada's secret that Indians know about, First Nations people know. This has been hidden and swept under the rug for hundreds of years. Nobody knows this story unless you've gone out and researched it for the last 25 years, like I have, because I needed to know. I needed to connect the dots, because we went from this strong, powerful warrior nation that respected women and children and the earth in a balanced way, to the ugly stereotypes that I grew up with, that we grow up with every day out there in our high schools, in our schools, and on the streets of this country. As a nation, if we want to heal together, Right? This is it. Side by side, brothers and sisters. Respect, but not controlling each other's boats. And I have to believe for the sake of my daughter that we'll get back to that. Right? That's what I strive for every day. And we can't get back to reconciling this until we all understand the truth about how we got to the state that we're in today. That guy down there with the bottle asking for change in his spirit is a strong, surviving, proud warrior. And the fact that he's alive and still here today says that more than anything else. My people are still not in a very good shape. We're in, we're in a tough condition across this country. Our suicide rates are 10 times that of the national average. Our substance abuse is 10 times the national average. The incarceration system in Canada, 65% indigenous. Some places, 90%, depending on where you live. Right? We make up 3% of the Canadian population, less than three, but 60-some percent of the jail population. That's not from bad choices, people. That's from years of government policy, genocide, and assimilation. It took that long to get us in the state that we're in today. And it's going to take a long time for us to dig out of that hole. And it starts with you knowing this truth. Hearing it, feeling it, right? I have a good friend, <laughs> he, he always says, Joel, 
just teach the positive stuff. Focus on the positives, you know? And I like to end on a positive note all the time because he's right. I hate teaching this story because you can tell it breaks my heart. It's very personal for me. I, I, I like the little ones. I like the feathers and the fur and the medicines and, and the pre-contact beauty of our culture. That's what I thrive in teaching. I couldn't do this every day because it just knocks me down so bad. But he always says, Joel, focus on the positives. Focus on the positives, man. And, and that's what I do. Like I say, for the most part of my job, I just focus on those positives. I, I try to forget about this, even though this is what drives me. Um, but it's really hard to tell this in a positive way. And I hope I've done a semi-good job of being kind as I told it, because it's not about blaming somebody. I don't blame anybody, because those guys are all long dead. You know, I could blame the government. You know, I blame my dad for being an alcoholic, for leaving my, my mom when, uh, you know, when I was seven years old. I blame my grandpa for, for raising him that way. And the more I dug and the more I learned, I realized blame is useless. You know, it took me years to really grasp that concept. Shame and blame and, you know, like living in this past, it doesn't help at all. What's important is today and the future, right? Where are they? The future. This is what's important. I do this work with kindergarten students because I know when they grow up to be adults, they're going to remember the beautiful teachings of the Ojibwe people. They're not going to look at Indians like, you know, a lot of Canadians do that haven't received those beautiful teachings. It's about that ripple effect for the future generations, for my children and, and for our nations to move forward together and get back to that beautiful relationship that I really think should never have been broken. One thing that's really driven my work is um, one of the prophecies of the First Nations people in the plains. Um, and as you know, I call my lessons White Buffalo Circles. So um, White Buffalo prophecy has really been inspiring to me and my father before me about the work that we do. So I just want to share that with you um, kind of as we wrap up these videos. In the plains when the buffaloes roamed freely um, before that time where, where they were all kind of slaughtered, one in every five million buffalo was born white. Not albino. Albino species have pink nose, pink hoofs, and white fur. These creatures had black nose, black hoofs, and beautiful cream-colored fur. Uh, there were many species of buffalo as well, including the saltwater buffalo, which are now extinct. Um, but these animals were considered sacred to these tribes, the white buffaloes. They never hunted them and killed them. They were sacred creatures. They were so rare. And when the prices went on the buffalo hides and the slaughter began, <clears throat> those ones were probably killed first because um, they knew how special they were to those tribes in the, in the plains. So when the white buffalo disappeared and the reserve systems began, it really began this super dark chapter for First Nations people here in North America. And the prophecies began to come during this time. Um, the elders began to have visions that one day the white buffalo would return to Turtle Island. One day she would come home. And when that day came, it would represent a time in Turtle Island when First Nations people could pick up their bundles again, pick up their way of being, and begin to walk with their heads up and walk in that good way that they'd walked with for so many thousands of years. And um, for me, I don't believe in coincidences. You know, this is a prophecy that predated um, her return long, long, many hundreds of years. In 1996, in northern Canada, northern Turtle Island, um, the last residential school closed. And as they were ripping down the bricks of that school, um, I was 18 years old. I had just started my journey in post-secondary education. And here in North Dakota, in the middle part of Turtle Island, the following spring in 1997, the first white buffalo was born. And that sent shockwaves all across Turtle Island to every corner, to every First Nations person walking this red road, that the white buffalo has returned. Now was the time to pick up those bundles and not just practice the culture to ourselves, not just walk that road ourselves, but to share it. That prophecy speaks specifically of having these teachings and sharing them with all the four races of mankind in that medicine wheel. 
And that teaching has drove me and it drives me to this very day, which is why, again, I call these circles white buffalo teachings because today there are many white buffaloes roaming North America. We are living in the age of the white buffalo. And as tough of a job as this is to do, it was prophesied that now would be the time that we walk with these bundles and we share these teachings with the rest of humanity. These aren't just First Nations teachings and all these videos. These are teachings for, for humanity, teachings how to live that good life, that red road, thinking of our children in the future generations. So I kind of want to end it there with that, that teaching, that prophecy of the white buffalo, and let you know that even though this is a dark history, um, we're living in a time of rebirth and strength and renewal for the, for the First Nations people of North America and for our brothers and sisters that call this place home as well. So um, we got a long way to go, my friends. And um, I encourage you again to, to learn this truth, to take it in, to digest it, and to share it in the kindest way that you can. Um, focus on the positives, yeah, but um, think about this is why I teach this, is so that we can come out of this place and an understanding and we can begin to reconcile our beautiful cultures and our nations and in that understanding of the nation to nationship relationship. So, um, Chimmy Glitch, everybody, for, for listening, for tuning in. I hope you learned something here today. Um, I, again, I don't like teaching this very often, which is kind of why I put it on video so I don't have to relive it a thousand times. But uh, thank you so much for tuning in and paying attention. and, and uh, and bum up here. Anin, bojo. Joel Egoista and Dijnikas. I really want to, I feel it's very important to mention that um, one thing that bothers me as far as doing the videos and um, even sometimes with time constraints in the classroom is my inability to wrap it up in a good way. Um, this history lesson, especially if you're a First Nations person, even as a human being living in, in these lands, can be very hard to hear and take in. Um, it can leave a lot of emotions raw uh, inside of you. So um, I do want to offer this number to, uh, especially to First Nations students who are really experiencing that kind of feeling, um, the emotions that, that I portrayed again in this video. So I'm gonna show a little number here on the screen. It's actually a helpline for indigenous people to a talk line um, to talk about the impacts of residential school and the intergenerational trauma that uh, many of us who didn't go to those schools suffer today, especially when we hear the stories of our, of our ancestors and the things that they've been through. So please don't hesitate to call this number um, to talk to your family. You know, um, my, the lesson isn't meant to to make you feel sad, it's about awareness for, for the history and the culture. Um, but if you're like me and this is the first time you've heard this lesson, you're probably experiencing some pretty raw emotions and I would encourage you to contact this number um, and really take care of that medicine wheel inside of you. Um, go out and have a smudge, go out and talk to the creator, go out and speak with your ancestors because this journey of healing and gathering of knowledge is something that doesn't stop um, with a video or with any day, right? So, miigwech so much for, for listening and learning with me. Um, stay strong out there. You know, be proud of who you are, no matter who that is. And um, just good luck. Miigwech.